How do ribosomes know what proteins to make? We now know that it's the messenger RNA that tells the ribosomes what to make, but we had to figure that out. And one of the key figures in figuring this out was a scientist named Hildegard Lampham, who not enough people know about, and she was this really amazing scientist. Um, she did some pioneering work on cell-free protein synthesis, helped show that messenger RNAs told the ribosomes what to do, helped show that the ribosomes actually work in like polyribosomes, polysomes, like um, so you have a lot of ribosomes actually working together and that it wasn't just like a big, that, heavier fraction wasn't just a big clump of inactive stuff and so she did this really amazing work um not enough people know about her she has this really cool story too um as i found out when i made a wikipedia page for her a few years ago and my post on cell-free protein synthesis the other day helped remind me of her amazing work and so i thought i would share um so that you guys can learn about her too and help spread the word of how awesome she is and also just this voice is just really really cool so I'll take you back to my blog post later to tell you more about Hildegard. Um, but you should know just for now that she was carrying out this work in mainly the 1950s and 1960s, working with um, Richard Shui at Taltech and later with Paul Knopf at MRC. Um, and so let's get into her work helping develop one of the first in vitro translation systems using rabbit reticulate lysate. Um, I should know that she was not the only person working in this field, and I don't want to make it seem like I'm giving her all the credit, but she was one of the key figures. Um, so let's take a look at what she did. So proteins are made in the process of translation where a messenger RNA, so a copy, a RNA copy of a DNA gene, gives the instructions to these protein making complexes called ribosomes and the ribosomes travel along them and they add amino acids, which are protein letters and they link them up in the order that's specified by the messenger RNA and it's going to make the final protein. So we know all of this now, but people had to figure this out. And so Hildegard was at the forefront of helping figure this out. And she was, she was showed that the messenger RNA was actually directing pro the ribosomes to make specific proteins. And she showed that polyribosomes were like a thing. And so basically different, there were people knew at this time that ribosomes were involved in making proteins, but they wasn't, weren't sure like what was actually telling the ribosome what to make. Where was the information coming from? Was it coming from the ribosome itself? Like were there different ribosomes that are make like this ribosome is going to make this protein, this ribosome is going to make this protein like all the time, or could the ribosomes actually be programmed? And so she was one of the people that helped show that ribosomes could actually be programmed. And she used some really cool experiments to do this. But in order to do this, she needed to establish a system where she could study this sort of thing. So we, you need something where you have some more control because the ribosomes, if you're just studying them in cells, how do you know where the ribosome is getting its info from? But if you could purify out those ribosomes and then add things like messenger RNAs, you could show that the messenger RNAs were actually directing the ribosome. So she needed to establish a cell-free protein synthesis system. So we talk more about this, um, I post on cell-free protein expression, but one of the main um, ways that people do study protein expression is using a lysate, some sort of lysate. So lysates where you like break open cells and use the stuff that's inside of them. So she developed one of the, she helped develop one of the key systems that is in use today, which is this rabbit reticulose lysate lysate or RRL. Um, so a reticulocyte is this type of blood cell. And basically when blood cells mature, they lose their nuclei. Um, so they don't have all that DNA and stuff, but they still make a lot of hemoglobin, which represents about 90% of the proteins that they make. So these blood cells are basically chock full of these messenger RNAs for the hemoglobin. They don't have their, their nuclei, so they're not making new messenger RNAs for other things. And so now they're going to make um, lots and lots of hemoglobin, which is important because hemoglobin is what is going to be carrying oxygen throughout the blood, which is basically the cell's main function. So if you break the cells open, so you lyse them and you use that lysate, then you're gonna find a bunch of messenger RNA recipes for the light, for hemoglobin. And so just to tech notes, Hemoglobin is actually made up of several chains and they each have their own mRNAs, but I'm just gonna draw it as one thing and the cells have like mRNAs for like all the different chains. 
So that's not all the, the lysate has though. It also has everything that's needed for translation. So it has the ribosomes, amino acids, and all the other molecular machinery that's needed for the translation process. So these days people actually degrade all of this hemoglobin and messenger RNA and introduce different messenger RNA. So you can imagine that if you tried to get this lysate, you took this lysate and you tried to you put in your own messenger RNA and tried to get it to make a protein. If it had, it was just it would make mostly hemoglobin because that's what hemoglobin, all that messenger RNA for hemoglobin is basically going to outcompete for what you want to put in. So these days people think use things like microcrocal nuclease to actually degrade all of the messenger RNA that's in there before they add the messenger RNA they want. But we um Hildegard was actually going to use this messenger RNA that was in there. And working with Paul Knopf, she took advantage of it all to use it to study translation in general. This lysate was going to be really, really good at making hemoglobin so she could study the hemoglobin making. So this is one of her key experiments from 1964, initiation of hemoglobin synthesis in cell-free systems. So basically they took that rabbit reticulocyte lysate and added radioactively labeled amino acids. So now when they're make when the cell when the lysate is making the protein that protein is going to become radioactive. And so they took samples over time and they separated the ribosomes from the hemoglobin and looked to see where the radioactivity was. So early on the radioactivity associates with the ribosomes and then later it starts to shift to the hemoglobin and then as it gets released. So in this graph, basically what they're showing, they're able to separate the ribosomes and the hemoglobin by spinning them in a gradient. So when you spin um, things in like a density with density gradient centrifugation, so you can have like a glycerol or something gradient, and the heavier stuff is going to sink, and then you're going to get this separation of things by size. So the, the ribosomes are going to be farther down and then the free stuff is all going to be up here at the top. And so this way they could separate the different fractions and they could separate the fraction that had the ribosomes from the fraction that had the hemoglobin. And so then they could, because it was radioactive, they could then measure the radioactivity in those fractions and compare them. So this white circles, these are the ribosomes. And so this is over time. So they added the letters and so protein making can start or continue. And they see that initially they have this increase in radioactivity as these letters are getting incorporated, but they're being incorporated in that heavy ribosome fraction and not in the hemoglobin fraction because well, there's not right now any hemoglobin that's getting released is probably gonna be stuff that's just, that was already made or was almost finished. So you're really gonna get a little. But over time, as those proteins get made and released, now you have this uh, radioactivity is going to be seen in this hemoglobin portion. And so, but now what's going to happen? And so here they're showing, this is a key experiment that's helping show that this, that the ribosomes in the system, they were actually making protein, they're incorporating amino acids. But a question is, well, now what? what can those ribosomes do? Can they make another molecule or are they like finished? And in order to make another molecule, they would have to start from scratch, right? Like they'd have to make, start making an amino, they'd have to start making, initiate synthesis of hemoglobin. So there could have been the case that you, your cells just had a bunch of ribosomes are already partway through making hemoglobin and that's when, therefore, if you add radioactive stuff, they can finish making the protein that they already started, but they can't start new. And so in order to show that they start, they could actually start new, that they could initiate de novo um, translation, what they did was they actually like labeled the ends um, and they were able to show like that the end terminal, like it was like a valine so they can compare the amounts of valine that was radioactive to like, like compare the end terminal radioactive versus like the total. So like the terminal valine versus internal valine. And basically if you have the, if you have in here, they're showing that with their, in here they're showing that in the, like in the cells, 
so that you have this ratio of 8.7 for, so this is representing uniformly labeled hemoglobin. So basically if you have it all, if it was made from scratch, then all of the, all of the valines were going to be radioactive and you get this ratio of 8.7 when you measured, like compare the radioactivity of all the valines of the terminal valine versus the total valine. So that's what this is showing. If you didn't have synthesis, then you would have a lower percentage um, because you'd have less of the terminal and more of the total. And if you had absolutely no, you would have zero because no, you would have no terminal valine, but you would have the total valine um, because the protein was already in progress. But they can see that in their lysate system and also um, to some extent in their frac totally fractionated system, so where they separate the components and mix them together, that they're getting incorporation, they're getting initio in, ugh, they're getting initiation um, in synthesis, they're actually getting proteins to start being, um, start being made. They would later find that they were kind of, the, the, the messenger RNA was getting debrided when they were trying to do the fractionation. And so the, that was why they had like this lower efficiency compared to in their lysate fractions. And so if they didn't separate everything, if they just used this lysate whole, then that was, that would give them this higher efficiency. So we know that these ribosomes can start making new proteins. But how do they know what to make? So we're back to that question of, well, is this ribosome like destined to always make this one protein or can it make something else? A problem with working with that hemoglobin system, at least how they were originally doing it, is that those cells have so much of the hemoglobin in them, like the messenger RNA for hemoglobin, that that's basically all you'd ever see them make. So you can't say, oh, well, now I see this other protein getting made because these lysate is just chock full with this messenger RNA for hemoglobin. So that's all you're gonna see. But you can see different, you can see if you were to take lysates from different organisms. So say from a rabbit or from a sheep, they would have different hemoglobin proteins. So the lysate would contain messenger RNAs for hemoglobin in both cases, but for the spe their species own hemoglobin. So now if you, you are able to separate out the ribosomes and kind of mix them, so you basically put a sheep, a sheep ribosome fraction with the rabbit hemoglobin um, messenger RNA, or I mean, with the rat, with the lysate for from the rabbit, and then like the rabbit ribosomes with the lysate from the sheep, then you could see, okay, well now which is going to get made? If the like ribosome was destined to make the thing that it always made, then the sheep ribosome would always make sheep hemoglobin, even if you stuck it into the rabbit lysate, and the rabbit ribosome would always make rabbit hemoglobin, even if you stuck it into the sheep lysate. But if the instructions were coming from something in the lysate, which we now know we, is they're coming from the mRNA, then this would tell you that the ribosomes could be programmed. And this is indeed what they found. So for example, in the highlighted row, you have the rabbit ribosomes. So they call their ribosomes, they're calling them microsomes. Um, and so this is the R's for rabbit. And basically they take the rabbit light ribosomes and they take the rabbit lysate and you get rabbit hemoglobin. If, but if you take the rabbit hemoglobin, you take the rabbit ribosomes, those same ribosomes and you mix them this time with sheep lysate, now you get just 62% rabbit with 38% sheep. So she interpreted this for a support for Jacob et al's theory that messenger RNA program tells the ribosome what protein to make. Um, and so as she puts it, the results of this rabbit sheep mixed incubation experiments here reported here do not contradict the messenger RNA concept. It is hoped that experiments now in progress will show whether such a scheme is actually valid. And so she, 
Um, so you see that you only got like 62% rabbit or whatever, but she interpreted, she speculated that someone like the ribosomes had their own animals messenger RNA attached, so that would get made still. But then they, when they got in the lysate, they'd meet a bunch of the other animals, hemoglobin, um, mRNA, and be able to make that too, so you'd get both. Yeah, so they're able to use various like chromatography methods and stuff in order to, be, to tell apart the rabbit and the sheep. And I'll show you the papers if you want to look more. So one of the other key things that she did was help show existence for polyribosomes and showing that polyribosomes were actually like a site of active protein synthesis and not just like clumpy aggregates of gunk. And so what is a polysome, a poly or a polyribosome? Um, so basically this is where you have multiple messenger, you have multiple ribosomes working on the same messenger RNA. So this allows them to be super duper efficient because you have this big old messenger RNA and you just had one ribosome using it at a time. Well, that wouldn't be very efficient since they can both, they can multiple can be working at the same time. This guy's just gonna be a little further along in the protein making than this one. So people take advantage of this with like polysome profiling in order to see which messenger RNAs are being made, how well, you can do things like treat cells to see if their translation changes. And so polysome profiling is like this huge thing that's really important now, but people didn't even know if polysomes were basically like a thing. And so Hildegard helps show that these polysomes are an active site of protein synthesis and that new ribosomes can join in. So here's another one to keep the key paper, um, experiments from the lamp on and off paper from 1964, JNPM, when basically here what they're doing is they have ribosomes that are radioactive. So they're adding the ribosomes in. So before we are labeling the amino acids, here we're labeling the actual ribosomes. And they wanna see, can these ribosomes get incorporated into the polysomes? And are these polysomes where a protein is actually getting made? So here the figure is kind of backwards. So normally when we're looking at a polysome profile, it's the heavier stuff. So like the polysomes are gonna be out on the right and the lighter stuff is going to be on the left. But in their graph, we have the lighter stuff on the right and the heavier stuff on the left. So we have the polysomes are gonna be over here and the monosomes are going to be over here. Um, so the monosomes is where you have the ribosome on here and then you have your free ribosomes over here. And so basically what do they see? So the, the circles are going to be this clear, these unfilled circles are no ATP at 25 degrees Celsius. And so they just have the ATP that was already in the lysate. They didn't add any extra in. And we know that ATP is really important for making protein synthesis. Um, and so when they add ATP, you see you get a boost. And you get a boost in this polysome fraction, not just um, every not just the monosomes. And so this is helping show that the ATP making, so the, pro, the ATP adding is, sent, is adding to the protein making um, or encouraging the protein making, accelerating the protein making, um, enabling it. And so you get more in of these monosomes being, in, you get more of the free ribosomes that are labeled being incorporated into this heavy portion corresponding to the polysomes. And you also see an increase when you're at um, 25 degrees versus zero degrees. And so you see you're getting these boosts in these heavier fractions and not just the free ribosomes hanging out. So in the paper, they did a lot of other work too to show that it's actually the, the polysomes are actually where the protein synthesis is happening. And so they found that the when they labeled various things when they're labeling the amino acids um, and that sort of thing, that the radioactivity, the protein was getting made in the polysome fraction and not just like in the free ribosomes or in the monosomes. And so they found too that the, so the incorporation, so when they're adding those labeled ADS ribosomes, then these ribosomes are getting incorporated into these polysomes. And this is happening when protein synthesis is, um, is active. As the protein synthesis stops, you get the dissociation of these polysomes and the stopping of the protein synthesis. And so this is 
also helping support this idea that you have the free ribosomes are able to join into the messenger RNA, making that polysome. And that's actually where the protein synthesis is happening. And then the free protein is going to get released. And so they also, this is also in this paper where they do the labeling of the ends. And so they're showing that this lysate is able to initiate the synthesis of new hemoglobin chains. From one third to two thirds of all chains completed were synthesized de novo during the incubation. Uh, both the polysomes and the ribosomes were able to initiate the synthesis. And so this is, but the polysomes and the ribosomes um, on their own were able to initiate the synthesis, but the ribosomes didn't do so as well as the polysomes. And so, but the eight, but the ribosomes were able to get incorporated into the polysomes, suggesting that this ribosome is able to acquire the information necessary for the synthesis of a whole molecule, and that it's making these molecules mainly in this polysome portion where you have multiple ribosomes working on the same messenger RNA. And of course, at this time though, they didn't have conclusive proof that it was the messenger RNA in the lysate that was actually doing things. They just um, have support for that hypothesis. It is not, it cannot be deduced from these experiments whether the messenger for hemoglobin is in the ADS ribosome as it is isolated from the lysate or whether the messenger is in the supernatant fraction and becomes attached to the ribosome during incubation. And so that's where those other experiments come in that were helping show that it can synthesize something different than what it was originally like programmed to make. So I'm a little unclear on the date line of all of this various stuff um, because this paper was in 1964 and then the other one that I um, will direct you to was 1961 when they're doing the showing that it can be from a different cell, but I guess they still haven't showed whether um, like it'll start making something different, but they can't say for sure what it is that's actually making them make something different. Um, but they find that it's consistent with the idea of this messenger RNA hypothesis. And so I encourage you to check out these papers. They're kind of dense, um, but they're really chock full of some really great science. Um, and it's really cool to be able to see how these how these sorts of discoveries come about and all of the proof that you need to show in order to um, really determine what is going on. And so really, really cool work and really fundamental for a lot of the science that we do today, both in terms of self resynthesis, in terms of work with polysomes, really, really cool stuff. And we have Hildegard Lamfront and a bunch of other scientists, but I'm highlighting Hildegard today because I did not even know about her until a few years ago when I made a Wikipedia page from her. I don't even remember how I came across her name initially, um, but I am very grateful that I did. And so she was originally from Augsburg, Germany in 19, where she was born in 1922. Um, her family was Jewish and they fled Nazi persecution um, when she was only 15, um, came to the US and established themselves in Portland, Oregon. Um, money was tight. And so when she went to college at Reed to study biology, she actually worked at shipyards to finance her education. She got a master's in biology and got accepted at what's now Case Western, um, Case Western Reserve University's medical school. But she was drawn to research instead of medicine and decided to go for the PhD instead, which I, that is the case with me as well. I started out pre-med. Well, I, I guess she was, got accepted into medical school, I never applied to medical school, but um, decided I really love the research and went the PhD route. So she went and got her PhD in 1949 for work on the renin anti renin system, which is something that helps regulate blood pressure. Um, and she was doing this under the advisement of Harry Goldblatt, um, who she followed to California and kept working for him at Cedars of Lebanon Hospital in LA. And she did research all around the world after that, Denmark, California, England, France, Oregon, California, Boston, I said California twice, but um, yeah, she did some work in California. Um, and she even set up a laboratory called BioCenter in India um, with her close friend, Anand Sarabha. Um, and she was, she was, 
she mentored a lot of um, really big name scientists too, like Brian Drucker, who um, you might know him him from Gleevec, the um, cancer medicine. And so she actually, her sister is very famous too and helped, wanted to help and is one of the key advocators for, is one of the key um, ambassadors for Hildegard. Um, so her sister is Gertrude Broyle, um, who served as the president of Columbia Sportswear um, and became a bit of an entrepreneurial legend. Um, but for, to, to Gert, one of the most important things was that people knew about her sister Hildegard. And so she donated a lot of money to Oregon Health and Scientists Sciences University for cancer research. And so they named fellowships and bundings, buildings after her. So thank you, Gert, for helping spread the word about your sister as well.